Hello and welcome to this episode of Your Golden. I'm doing an intro to this episode because I originally wanted to make this episode one massive episode because they are two different interviews with two different emotional manifestors and my original intention was to make these individual conversations about 30 minutes long and put them in one mass episode and basically make it where you're getting two different perspectives all at once and the fact of the matter is these are two very different people two very different interviews two very different perspectives so this was an editing nightmare <laughs> to continue to do the do it the way that I wanted to do it so I decided just to I'm putting these out as they were recorded so in this first episode we are talking to joy and this conversation is very logical. It is following a pretty step-by-step process. It's very question-answer. Here's a couple of stories to explain what I'm talking about. That kind of conversation. If you are familiar with human design, her variables, the arrows up at the top of the up at the body graph, they're all pointing left. So she's what is called the quad left. So she is quite left-oriented, meaning more structured, more logical, that kind of thing. But at the same time, she's a multi-passionate creative. So this is a very fascinating conversation about how her design has some impact on her creative process and vice versa. How does her creative process have impact on, on her? So if you're looking for a very structured conversation, then the conversation with joy might be just the right fit for you. The other episode that I have, which this is going to be the same intro for both, (laughs) is with Ginger Nicole. And she's also an emotional manifestor. And this conversation is incredibly expressive. She has such a gift for being able to have such beautiful metaphors for what she's experiencing and it's so easy to see their real life application how those metaphors are such great examples of what it's like to be an emotional manifester so this conversation is one where it's really going to get your brain in an in an imaginative space and it's going to give you a more right leaning approach to the emotional manifester way of living and what i mean by right is under human design terms those right arrows are more creative in nature they're not as logical. They're a bit more seeing all of the nuances, that kind of thing. And I just want to make it super, super clear right here that these little descriptions I just gave about left arrows versus right arrows is a oversimplification of what they are, what they mean, what they do. So please don't take this as totality, but just more as an indicator of maybe what to expect. So if you are an emotional manifester, I highly encourage you to listen to both episodes so that you can get two different perspectives, see which one resonates with you more. A lot of the things that they're talking about are very similar. I I would hope so, right? Because we're talking about specifically being an emotional manifester manifester. So there are some similarities in their experience, but they describe it in such different ways that really gives you a different angle and a different understanding, almost to the point of it feeling like two completely different things. So I hope that you listen to both. I hope that they give you, you know, the help that you need or the perspective that you're looking for. That's the whole point of this authority series is to really give you an a real life 
perspective and account of what is it like to live as this type of design. I really hope that this helps you understand the process to come, especially if you're early on in your in a, your experiment and you're trying to make sense of all these words and how it feels and how you're quote unquote supposed to do it and all of that stuff that kind of gets us confused. I really hope that these conversations take away some of that confusion and show you just really what's in store and that what you're experiencing is most likely exactly beautiful and perfect and what you quote unquote should be experiencing. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you get a lot of learning and experience and perspective out of this. And if you feel so inclined, please connect with Joy and or Ginger. Have a lovely day. Hey there, you're listening to Your Golden, a podcast dedicated to helping you see that you are golden just as you are. I'll use every tool and personal story I have to help guide you back to yourself. Blending two seemingly opposing sides is my specialty, so you can expect pragmatism and mysticism, details and exploration, ponderings and answers, clarity and unknowns, and so much more. If I had to sum up the ethos of your golden, it would be summed up by the words of Nobel Peace Prize winner Albert Schweitzer, who once said, The path of awakening is not about becoming who you are, rather it is about unbecoming who you are not. Welcome to the show. Today we have Deanna Joy, who is a life coach for multi-passionates and the host of the Multi-Passionate Mastery Podcast. So welcome today, Joy. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here and for our conversation today. Yes. Cool. I'm so glad you're here. So just so people know and have a little bit of frame of reference, we have worked together both actually technically in both roles, like we've coached each other in different ways. And so when I was coaching you for a while, we were really working on getting used to that emotional authority and using it, feeling it, trusting it, not being so angry about it. So we're really going to go in today on how it is now, and especially in relationship to the fact that you are a manifester. And as we've personally talked before, an emotional manifester is, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood specific types. So yeah, I'm so glad that you're here today. So just to get into it, I would love to hear your personal definition of what the emotional authority is. Yeah, the definition that I have come to over the years that's created the most resonance for me is emotional authority is the concept that taking my time saves me time. Mm. So when I take my time to allow something to develop in my thought space, in my body space, in my energetic field, often when I do come to my neutral yes or my neutral no or my neutral maybe later i have such a clearer understanding of the breadth of the thing when i first get that hit i often i'm getting way better at this even now but typically when i would first get a hit i would receive an idea and i wouldn't really know what it was actually going to require of me energetically and so if i would have said yes too soon then i might end up being depleted and then, okay, so now we're back to now. I actually have lost a lot of time because I need to get my energy back. And so I've learned that emotional authority means taking my time to feel things out and knowing that it's not really waiting, it's that it's going to save me time in the future. And that's where I've come to understand Mm. it these days. I love that. That reminds me of something that I think of frequently and that is, to go fast, you have to go slow. So it's kind of that same concept of like slowing some things down, waiting so that when the time does come, you can go 
the speed that you want, especially as a manifester who wants to go as fast as possible. So first let's then get into your own experience before you learned the language of human design, before you knew anything about manifestors, emotional authority, et cetera. How did it, how did this emotional wave feel at that time before it, there were words to really understand it? Before I had the language of human design and the knowledge of human design, I would have just considered myself someone who was really, really sensitive and like can engage and can talk, but also needs time alone. And like, if I need to cry, I will block off time. Like I'm going to go cry for a few hours <laughs> or like, I need to just take a bath and literally sit in the water in the well of my feelings. And I always took time to feel my feelings as a kid. I don't feel that I was very understood. My mom would sometimes say, you know, I, something, and it's funny because she said this to me recently and it took me right back to childhood. I was like, oh my goodness. I would come to her and I'd be crying about something and she would say, I can't understand you when you're crying. You need to take a breath, stop crying, and then you can tell me what you need to say. She'd be like, I can't, she just was like, you're doing too much. Like you need to basically calm down. And I'd be like, ah, ah, you know, like trying to express through tears. And recently I called her because I got some good news and I was crying and she was like, I can't understand you, take a breath. And I was like, oh my gosh, here we go again. So yeah, I think before human design, I would have just thought of myself as someone who was emotional and sensitive, someone who was highly impacted by things. In terms of like what my decision-making process was like, before understanding emotional authority, it's interesting because I almost I don't know what to say. I feel like I have no language on how to describe what that's like because I don't think it was very intentional or that I was very present. I was sort of moving through life probably with a lot of generated conditioning, just responding to things. I don't know that I was necessarily initiating to an extent, but I think I crowdsource a lot of things. You know, well, what would you like and what should I do? versus just making the choice and, and kind of going for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then when you did learn about being a manifester, did that alter about that initiation or like initiating things and taking action on things? I, I would imagine that once you learned like, oh, I shouldn't really be responding. I should be ahead. I was, should be initiating more. Did, did that have any play with that emotional authority? You know, when you first learn that you're a manifester, one of the things you learn is you're here to initiate and you're not here to wait. You're not here to wait. All the other types have to wait. You don't have to wait, which is mm, kind of a fallacy because even the manifestors waiting for a strong inner urge, to, you know, essentially. But where I was very frustrated, angry, and confused when it came to emotional authority in wanting to live my design as a manifester, especially when we were working together, is that I didn't understand if I was supposed to follow my urges and I didn't need to wait to initiate, then how was I expected to then wait and ride this, you know, ephemeral emotional wave, <laughs> this kind of like, Emotional wave is like this this elusive concept until you really understand what it feels like, you know, from experimentation. Mm -hmm. So it, it it confused me a lot in the beginning. You know, learning how I was a manifester brought me tons of clarity in a lot of other areas. The way that I work, I knew I didn't have to wait. If I had an idea for a course, I didn't have to test the market and see if people wanted it. I just needed to launch it and form that it was there and let that so things like that became very very clear i know i need a lot of rest and emotional authority was kind of like this piece of the puzzle that i just could not wrap my head around until i you know abandoned it so often that i ended up having so many messes to clean up that i realized okay if i had taken a couple of days to think about this i might have said no i might have avoided months and like therapy sessions and all of these things I needed to do to course correct. And that's when I was able to finally go, okay, maybe I need to go ahead and experiment a little bit more intentionally with emotional authority. But in the beginning, 
it really can it made me feel confused especially about the part about urges i think the urge paired with emotional authority like you said it's it's really complicated mm -hmm. okay let's try to dissect that a little bit because i'm sure that many other emotional manifestors can hear your words and they're like yeah that is exactly how i feel that that struggle but still needing to really understand how to work through it so I think the first thing is, can you describe what you mean by a manifestor urge? Yes, because I got one so recently. And it's interesting too, because I have new feelings about this in relationship to emotional authority. It's very, very new. I realize sometimes I get a strong urge because I'm riding an emotional wave. And that neutral answer comes through as like, here's exactly the flavor of what that looks like. Here's exactly what to do. And a lot of times it feels for me like downloading the entire idea at once, seeing the concept from beginning to completion all at once, being able to hop into my project management software, write out all the subtasks in one fell swoop, understanding each step that's gonna go into it and feeling energetically in my body what it will feel like to complete it even though the completion isn't like the part that really lights me up the initiation of it is a form of completion for me as a manifester so mm -hmm. as i am like thinking about oh okay i got this urge all right and sometimes i'll say i have this urge okay let me run it through my authority right because I'm so excited that I'm like, maybe I shouldn't take action now, but I'll still get the idea out. But recently I've had a couple of urges that I'm like, oh my goodness, I have this urge and this is the answer to that thing that I've been letting run through my authority. And when that mm -hmm. happens, I don't put any more blockades, I don't put anything else to stop the momentum. I go, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this. I might verbally process to a friend, I might give it one more sleep, but other than that, I'm like, okay, no, because I've already run this through my authority. This urge is the answer to that. And so I'm just gonna go for it. So I sort of have these two relationships with urges. Sometimes they come and I feel them and I go, okay, maybe I don't quite see it from start to finish. You know, maybe I see it from, see, get to the halfway point and I'm wondering, do I have the energy for that? I have questions. Well, am I gonna have the energy for that? How's that gonna feel? What's the time commitment for that? What's, you know, how, what does that fit into what I'm currently doing? Which is, I mean, this is also just kind of how my brain works because of the work that I do, but right, my yeah. mind goes there. So if I have a lot of questions, taking my time saves me time. If I have a lot of questions, my emotional wave, I don't have to actively try to search for the answers. All I have to do is give it some time. And my, like, you know, I'm informing, I and I will inform, hey, I have questions, I'll talk out loud. I have questions about this. And the universe, humans, whatever, it will respond to me. That's how it works, right? That's my relationship with the world, with life. I inform and I receive responses. And so if I have questions, I'm like, okay, let's run this through emotional authority when I receive a urge or a download that feels like I have no questions. And in fact, this is so crystal clear. I feel like I could start right now. And in fact, any questions I would have had have already been answered through that process. Then I kind of just go for it. So I'm sure urges feel different for each person. The experience is going to feel different, but I think there's a clarity of like, I want to do this. And there's a almost like, I have to do this. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit less of a choice. You feel like, okay, I have to do this. And if you feel I have to do this, this just feels like the right thing. And you have questions and there's certain parts of it you're not sure on. That's where emotional authorities really serve me. I can't speak for anyone else. When you get that urge, it's like, I have to do this. This just feels so right. And I'm so glad I didn't do that other thing because this is even better. And like, this is the solution to that thing I couldn't figure out before. Then maybe the urge is actually in response to something that was already in your emotional wave. So I don't know. I'm curious mm. your thoughts on this because 
this has been something really new that I've been experiencing the difference between an urge that I want to run through my authority versus an urge that I'm like, I can just do this tomorrow feels really, really Mm. right. Do you feel like there's a difference between those two or should every urge go through authority? No, I don't necessarily think it's that every urge goes through the authority in the most linear way that that sounds. But I also think that it takes time to get to the point where you know the difference. So I think yeah. to, to start. Years. Yeah. Years. Yeah. We're talking about years. I do like, and when I say recent, like I'm recently noticing some of these urges actually feel like responses to my willingness to ride a wave. This is, I'm talking about in the last two weeks. <laughs> wow, this that. recent. So okay. extremely recent. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, thank you for that context. This is about years of experimentation. Mm-hmm. And I chose to dedicate this year specifically to experimenting with my emotional authority because I felt like I, I there needed to be like a devotion to the practice because I avoided it for so long. Mm-hmm. So it definitely, I mean, in my case, it has definitely taken time. Mm -hmm. to feel the nuances and the difference in those urges. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I am curious though, because I've heard it described from other emotional manifestors in this way, which sounds incredibly similar to what you're explaining, but it, it is, sounds a little different is that it's often riding the wave is where the beginnings of all that initiation comes from. It's kind of like basically your creative process. Like the emotional wave gives you that creative process, whether or not you are releasing the thing yet, but it's like the time that you have to just get everything out to see what it is at all. Is that kind of what you're explaining? Yeah. So let me give you, let's like get out of the abstract. Let me give you some concrete examples. Yes. So I was hit with an urge to start a digital magazine called Thrive Guide, kind of inspired by my coaching program, but I've always wanted to be a magazine editor. Since I was a little girl, I thought that was like the field I would go into. I love design. I love writing. There's so many parts of magazines that, that feel good for me. And so I got this urge to do a digital you know, a free digital magazine, it'll grow my email list, I just, you know, all the, you know, strategic brain. And I was very excited about it. And I had questions. (laughs) So I was like, okay, we're gonna not take any action. But we're gonna run it through my through the authority. And as I was doing that, so speaking to what you just said, the first thing I did was I opened up notion and I kind of just brain dumped everything that was on my mind, what I wanted it to be like. My biggest question was, am I doing one magazine or am I doing something that people subscribe to and get multiple magazines? Then it was, well, what's gonna go in each issue? Because I had knew I had to have that outlined or the process would be so chaotic. So then I started thinking, okay, I could do this, I could do that. And I realized every single thing that would go into these digital magazines is essentially repurposed content. So that felt really good. Okay, cool. That feels very good and efficient for my workflow. And then I kept coming back to, is it monthly? Like what? And then I realized, yeah, no, I don't commit to things that are, that don't end. I've learned that. I don't, that does not work for me. I need to have, I need to know that I have an out. And if I choose to extend, then great. So I I took a day off and I went swimming. I went, I got like a resort pass and went to a local pool. And as I was swimming, I was thinking about this magazine. Now I had not told a single person about it, nothing. This is all process, process. I'm swimming and I'm thinking about it. So I get out and I grab my journal and I do a pros and cons list of monthly versus one issue. And I dump all that out. And where I landed was, okay, it's a 10 part collection delivered monthly. That way I don't have to try to perfect one issue and know that that's it and it's done. I can have people look forward to something, but I know I'm creating 10 of them. I can create three of them at once or whatever. It's all gonna be automated. I also chose they are not gonna be seasonal because if I do seasonal, it makes automation super confusing and chaotic. So it's simply 
10 issues <laughs> and someone signs up for one 30 days later they get the next one 30 days later they get the next one and i worked all of this out before i ever decided whether i was going to do it or not i hadn't even come to like am i actually going to produce thrive guide and so yes emotional that emotional wave can lend itself very well to the creative process another thing i did was I went and started looking at templates for digital magazines. And that was like full body goosebumps. Oh my gosh, I'm probably gonna do this. At that point I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm just ready to start. <laughs> and then I purchased a template and then I made a whole bunch of covers, like just a whole bunch of covers. And then finally I said, okay, I'm gonna inform a couple people. And they did exactly what you did. As soon as I said, I'm thinking about doing a digital magazine, they were like, oh, you know, <laughs> I was like, okay. And I don't crowdsource, like I don't need someone to tell me that I that to do it as a manifester, but it's nice to inform and receive a response. Like that is the relationship that I have with life. So well, you're also checking yeah. for impact. Yeah, so, I guess so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is a, a manifester practice, I would say, is that it's really yeah. important for, in a, and part of your informing process is really to, all right, how does this, how is this impacting a person's aura? Cause you're so penetrating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm so and glad I'm doing it. Good. Yeah. You're doing the, <laughs> yeah. the magazine. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So I'm so glad that you gave us specifics because this really just gives us, you know, something to bite into. So Something that I wanted to point out that you pointed out, but I just want to reiterate, you went through a whole creative process with, you know, what is it going to be before you even decided that you are doing it? Yep. Okay. I would wonder if, um, if people who are trying to get used to their emotional authority, have maybe previously assumed that just because they started on their creative process, that that means that they are doing it. But do you mm. feel like that has been something for you or no? In the past, yes. In the past, when I didn't truly understand emotional authority and I didn't understand that it was this dance you do with time to come to a space base of the most clarity that you're going to have access to on a specific subject. I didn't understand it like that. And so I would just, my thought would be like, how do I feel? Well, I don't feel super sad about it. So it doesn't feel devastating. So I'll just do it. And then you make enough choices from that perspective. And then you realize, okay, there's also how I'm managing my energy. There's also how much time this is now taking. There's also, if you know, if we're talking about like business related decisions, okay, now this is another call to action and another thing to include in my marketing. And did I think about all of that? You know, I have made the decision to create a course like in one sleep, like I'm just gonna do it, I'm just gonna do it. And then I'm like, oh, okay, now I'm in a whole course launch and it kind of just, and it was fine, but looking back, you know, did I have to do it that way? Maybe not, you know? And so before you, or before I, I don't, I don't like doing that. I don't, I don't know anyone else's experiences, but before I had this relationship and sort of gathered enough proof of waiting, actually working out a little bit better and feeling better, I still had a, that rebellious part of me as a manifester. You're, well, you're not going to tell me to wait. I like this idea. I'm not sad. I'm not devastated. I feel emotionally neutral, whatever that means. You know, I, that was like my attitude. I'm neutral <laughs> enough, whatever. I'll just do it. And when I was in that energy, if I had, you know, created a workflow, that meant I was probably going to carry it out. But now it's like exactly what you said, creating the workflow and then going, looking at it. How does that feel? Let me sleep on this. Let me look at this again tomorrow and see how that feels. Do I is this something that I can do? How does that feel? Even just last night, I was like, does it, do I wanna have it come out a week later? Am I gonna have everything ready by next week? Do I wanna have it come out a week later? I could easily shift the date. Okay, let me sleep on that, see how that feels. You know, so yeah, in the beginning I would have 
not been able to restrain myself enough to say, I have the whole plan, but I don't, that doesn't mean I have to do it. And these days it's in part because of the work that I do with my clients that I, I must uphold a certain level of walking the talk. And I teach multi-passionates how to prioritize, how to make sure that they do things in an order that creates the least overwhelm. And so in doing that work, it's enhanced my life where I make sure that I'm walking the talk. So I think that plays a big part in it as well. My ability to slow down a little bit and sometimes just say, okay, you don't have to do this. Or is this the right time to do this? Because it's not, mm-hmm. it's not always a hard no either. Sometimes it's okay later, later, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I've been wanting to make a magazine since I was like 16. <laughs> So, yeah. so it's, it's about time. <laughs> yeah. This is just kind of an aside, but as you're saying, you know, well, this is just a, one of the ways that I walk the talk of what I teach the, you know, the projector in me is just like, well, of course you even teach what you teach because this is a part of you and what you have needed to learn <laughs> for yourself. So Yeah. <laughs> And it's, again, it's doing it not that way for so long and feeling what that's like and living into what that's like and the burnout and the chaos and the lack of confidence in myself that I was ever going to be able to stick with anything long enough to see, like all of those things and then trying another way and feeling into that and going like, could I teach this? I could teach this. And then, you know. That's definitely been my experience, mm-hmm. 110%. So let's go back to your example. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the example that you gave is basic, is essentially an example of the most linear way to use the emotional authority. That is, this urge comes out of nowhere, so you're in the beginning of some kind of a wave to figure out if this is what you want to do, Correct. Yep. And I have a very nonlinear example, if that's where you're going. And it's also extremely recent. (laughs) Yeah. I would love to hear a specific example of what you're now seeing that an urge happens within the wave that is the answer that you were looking for of something that you were already processing. Yep. So I used to do these active focus co-working sessions every Tuesday. I charged $11 and 11 cents for them. And I, I promoted them pretty heavily on Instagram when I was still on that platform, a little bit to my email list. And it was kind of like this very low point of entry way to come and hang out and get some work done and, and get to meet me. And I would open it up with like maybe 10 minutes of a quick tip or something like that. And mistake I made was I didn't say, I'm doing these sessions for this month and this month, or I'm doing these sessions for this month. I just said, I'm doing these sessions and there was no finite end. Mistake, you know, we learn. And so eventually I realized, okay, I don't have the energy for this anymore. And I just stopped doing them. And I, what did I share? I shared a piece of content inside of my community for my clients who are in my coaching program. And it was a video of me, like the behind the scenes of one of my intensive focus sessions. So how I really clarify on a week to week basis, what to focus on. And one of my clients responded and it was very human design. We we have a language of human design in my program. And so she said a number of things. And then toward the end, she said, I hope that for you feel called, you'll consider bringing back the active focus co-working sessions because like I would love to plug into your will center basically I have eight defined centers so I tell my clients like yeah watch the replays when you're feeling down (laughs) you know like I have eight defined centers you can plug in and I always get off calls with my clients with my sacral like literally sometimes I'm vibrating like my body's vibrating and so I had been already considering, so when I closed those sessions, those public sessions, I was already considering if I bring these back, they will be for my clients and they'll be inside the program. And I left it there. Now, fast forward months and months and months later, I'm in a season of life where I'm working a little bit more, I'm preparing for maternity leave. So I'm working a little bit more now than I normally would but I have these days on my calendar that I covet and that I do not schedule any calls. 
That's Mondays because that's where I do my big picture focus. And then there's Tuesdays where I do active focus. And recently I broke my own rule and I scheduled a call on a Tuesday and it did not feel good. I was pissed at my, I, lots of anger, lots of manifest your anger. So when I saw my client's comment, when I was thinking about, you know, needing to be diligent about protecting Tuesdays or active focus, when I remembered that I had done those sessions and said that I might bring them back for my clients, it was like, oh, duh, we're going to do weekly active focus sessions for my clients only. That makes me make sure I don't have anything else on my schedule because I have to be there to host those sessions. I don't have to coach. We're all there to work. And it was like, got the urge as an answer to all of that, all of that that had happened over months and months and months, created the event, invited all the clients. Like it was like within 15 minutes, it was done. And it's on my calendar and the first, but you know what? Before I created the event and told my clients, I opened up my Google calendar and I put hold active focus session. And I put a start and I put an end. When are they gonna start? And when are they gonna end? They're gonna end when I go on maternity leave and then I'm gonna invite a community member to continue them if the group would like them to continue. So I put a finite end and I put them on my calendar and I looked at my calendar and I was like, how does that feel? And it felt fucking awesome. Cause I was like, you know what? If I'm ever tempted to do anything else on a Tuesday, I've already got something to do. And it's still active focus. It's still what I normally do on a Tuesday and it's serving my clients and it felt really great. Once I had that, then I created the event in my community, sent out the email to my clients that we now have this new event in the program. And that happened within like 12 hours, you know, from seeing the comment to, okay, now it's an event. And to my client, it probably felt like I was just responding immediately to her request, but really I had been thinking about it, you know, something that was sort of, that had just come back. So that's very non-linear, but mm -hmm. that urge came and I was like, I don't need days and days and days to think about this because I've already been in a space of considering, considering mm -hmm. that. Yeah. What a great example. Something that was coming to me as a question is, I, it sounds like you're pretty early on in this specific type of experiment, but my question is, is do you think that it, something feels important about the fact that these sessions already existed at one time and that maybe had something to do with like the quickness of how that authority process was working. So it, I mean, we don't have to go into many more examples or anything, but have you found when you're finding that urge in the middle of the wave, are you finding that it tends to be something that maybe has already existed? It's not a new thing to initiate. I don't have enough examples to spot a pattern there, hmm. but I would lean toward yes. I, and, and I don't, it, I don't know that it would have to be the thing, the actual thing that's already existed, but something similar enough where I can have an assessment of what my energetic output would be in relationship to the decision that I'm making. So mm -hmm. even with the magazine, I mean, I've designed eBooks, I've designed a lot of different things in terms of graphics. I know that for that magazine to have people subscribe to it, I need to have a landing page, right? there's nothing I love more than making a new page on my website, right? So, you know, I can feel into the parts. Now then I've got to set up the automated email sequence. Now that's where my energy starts to deflate a little bit, but I've spent enough time doing that. I know I can do that as well. So having some examples of what the energetic output is going to feel like always goes into the decision. And if I don't have an example, that means like, that is truly where the gift of time and feeling into it will come to play. And I think if I don't have examples of that, it's deep, deep permission that I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this out and see how it goes versus a super deep. Even when I started my podcast, I was like, we're doing seasons. <laughs> we're going to definitely do seasons because I wanted to see how I felt after season one. I wanted to see if I could keep going. This is also a multi-passionate thing. It's like, I, I feel like if you give yourself an out, you're just more likely to go through it because you know that you have a point where you can kind of assess. So 
podcasting is another example where I didn't know what was going to go into it. And it took me years to actually do it because I was so paralyzed with what is that process going to be like? What's going to go into it? I had no context. I ended up hiring a one-on-one podcast coach because I was so just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And, and trying to piece it together on my own wasn't working. So where I feel very inhibited and confused about energetic output that can cause a very a real slowing down for better or for worse so sometimes i need to like call someone in to support me so yeah i think you're onto something there definitely i think also what you were just referring to though is is important and and i i'm getting the sense that this is not necessarily just quote unquote, how it works, but almost just how it works, where some things for you to do can take years for that wave to finally come around to a point where, okay, yeah, it's time. Yeah. I I think we never know what will, for me, it, for me, it feels like questions that need answering, you know? Like with podcasting, I needed to listen to enough of other people's podcasts to go, oh, you could have a dope podcast that the episode could be like 20 minutes. Some of my favorite podcasts, the episodes are not super long. Some of my favorite podcasts, the majority of them are solo shows. So gathering all that data, like, okay, maybe I don't even have to do, I didn't do a single interview in my first season, you know, and all my episodes were like 15, 20 minutes (laughs) because I had realized, oh, I could just do it that way. So it's really helpful to, I guess that's just the gift of time. You know, you gather information. I think I used to think of emotional authority as like a very dormant time of, okay, I'll just wait till I come to neutral. And I didn't really think about what that, what my participation in that waiting would be. It's kind of like, a projector right like it's an active waiting you're not just waiting like oh hope someone invites me you're you're still creating your body of work you're putting yourself in environments where invitations like may be available right there's so it's it's more active and that's what i've realized in after years (laughs) of, of of not thinking of it this way that's what i've realized emotional authority really feels like and you're right sometimes it does take years because there might be something very specific that needs to fall into your awareness to make it all make sense. And mm-hmm. we don't know when that's going to come, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm glad you referenced your time of thinking about the emotional authority as just this, all right, just wait for neutral. Cause I remember when we worked together, I remember the, the conversation, it, it, there was so much emotion there and really just so much sadness because there was, I remember you saying something to the effect of how, how sad that I have to wait until my excitement is gone. Like I'll never be excited about an idea ever again. That, that sounds terrible. Can you speak to that a little bit more? I remember that. Yes. You know, when we were working together, I was also doing a lot of work around what's the right word for this, you know, I had a lot of sacral envy and I felt like I have all these other defined centers, but I can't freaking like work, you know? And that also felt really sad to me. And I was, and I remember saying, well, Lexi, what's the point of me starting anything if I don't have the energy to carry it on? Now I've learned, just give it an end date and you're cool. (laughs) But you know, back then. And so when I would say, well, when I get that urge and when I'm high in my emotional wave, that's when I have access to what I thought was like sacral energy. And I was like, and then I have to wait and just hope I have energy available for it. So a large part of that was accepting that I I don't have sacral energy. I don't have access to that consistently. And that's totally fine. I don't need that. I don't, if I needed it, I would have it. And so now I'm okay with that. Maybe because I have a defined root and defined will center that kind of (laughs) like- You have all the other motors. (laughs) I have all the other motors. So I still have a lot of help. I just know, 
you know, I've just had to learn when to stop and when to rest because I, I just, you know, to keep going, keep going is not in my nature. And so, yeah, that's where that was really coming from. It was this fear of, I don't have sacred. I, I used to, even though I have eight defined centers and this is normal, right? I mean, not normal, but this is, this makes sense in terms of what our open centers do to us in terms of conditioning. I would fixate on the one center that I didn't have access to. And I would fixate on the lack of that energy. And I remember that there was a turning point for me where I was like, why don't I spend a little bit of time with my defined centers? What is it like to have a defined will center? What is it like to have a defined root? Experimenting with my defined root changed my whole life. Cause I just realized I'm just gonna, I'll finish it the night before and that's how I'm gonna get it done. Like that is the propeller for me, you know? Or like, I will go walk my dog five minutes before a coaching call and be on time for the coaching call every time and be like ready to coach. And just and sometimes I wonder why don't I give myself longer transitions between things and it's like. I kind of like a little bit of time pressure feels so good for me, it keeps me energized throughout the day to like fit things in mm -hmm. so as I learn to embrace what I already have consistent access to it healed me in a lot of other areas, and I actually think now I never thought about it before, but in, in verbally processing now it helped me with emotional authority, like understanding when I am ready to do something, when I feel that it's time to do something, I have a defined root, I have a defined will center, you know, I can get it done. I have a defined heart. So if my heart's in it, is heart and will center the same? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> like I can do it. You know, when I really want to do something, I can do it. Mm -hmm. If I feel a little pressure and I feel a little bit of time pressure and there's a, a date that's coming up sooner, I truly do work quite well under that pressure, right? As long as I'm honoring that I know when to stop even in that. So that has helped me to be more willing to trust my emotional authority and to let go of feeling like if I don't take action when I'm in a super high wave, I'm just never gonna have the energy again. Also because taking action in a super high wave in the past has led to burnout for me. And so it's done the opposite of be energizing because I say yes to too many things if I act from that place and then mm -hmm. everything becomes kind of chaotic and then I have like less energy for everything. So I remember that really well, though. I'm glad you brought that up. Come a long way. Since yeah, then. yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm glad that you started bringing up the centers because I did want to make note. So Something that I've found to be super helpful in understanding your own authority and just how your specifically works, it's looking at what channel or channels get that center defined. So the emotional authority coming from the solar plexus. And then when we look at your solar plexus, you have one channel off of it and it goes to the will center. So your authority is highly charged by your will slash heart. And so what was fascinating while listening to all of your examples is that a lot of the questions that you often have in your mind to even decide if this is something to do or not are very closely aligned to the ego authority in, do I have enough energy for this? What's the timeline? What's kind of what's in it for me? A lot of those questions that you were saying were very tied to you specifically and not necessarily anything or anyone else. So you know, how do you feel about that delineation there? Do you feel like your will center does come into play with these decisions? I think so. I, I definitely think so. I What's in it for me is absolutely correct. And, you know, but I will say the majority of my channels are communal. Totally. So I Including know that, that anything one. I do. Oh, and, and even that one. And, yeah. So yeah. I know anything I do, even if I center myself at first, I know it's for the collective. I know it's, I know that whatever I do for me is for more than me. And I, and I, when I say no, I mean, it's a knowing it's, it's never a question. I know that any resource I create is for the community that I serve. And I've been so clear about who I serve and what that community looks like for so long, because that's my, I don't have any, I want to say I don't have any individual channel. I might have 
like one circuit or something, but very few. Yeah. I'm so, trying to recall. Um, I think the majority of your channels are all within the community based. Yeah. Circuit. Yeah. So I definitely do. But because I know if I'm, especially just as a manifester, a lot of us, you know, the first lesson we learn is, oh, we need to rest. Like we, we do not have a sacred motor. We cannot just keep going, going, going and making peace with that and healing around that and letting ourselves rest and knowing when to stop and feeling into that versus what it feels like to go hang out with all your like fun MG and generator friends and just you're going the hardest than you know like <laughs> I've experienced the gamut I have my three cousins who are also my best friends and they're all generators and you know we would hang out and then I would be like the most hungover like you know because I would just go the hardest and it's like okay interesting so you know we learn that about ourselves and for me those questions what's in it for me what's this energetic output like how much time is this going to take how long do I want to do this for? Do I want to do it once? Do I want to do it repeatedly? Those questions are all about protecting my sacral, honoring who I am as a non-sacral being and honoring that if I want to show up and do something well, there has to be an element of time to rest within the process or I cannot say yes to it. You know, A question that I also ask is, could I eventually hand this over? That's why I document my workflows so heavily because if i ever want to hand it over it's very easy i just duplicate the task reassign it here's everything that goes into this this is what i'd like you to do because manifestors do require support you know when we can when we can swing it so so yeah part of it is probably i think having that because my my so ego heart and will are they all the same i feel like i don't know yeah they're all the same that, or, no all it's the all the same so why do people why okay well maybe this is a separate preferred conversation words. But why preferred Just, words okay yeah. will center seems to be what i gravitate toward mm -hmm. i also love the word willingness it's like one of my favorite Ooh. words in the human language so maybe that's why i think so much can come from just being willing um mm -hmm. and my will to do something it feels very energizing it feels very much like a motor but yeah my my will center is something I always check in with in terms of what's in it for me. And also I know that in doing that, I'm still taking care of the community and the tribe based on all my tribal channels and my, you know, my communal circuitry that's in my chart. So mm -hmm. it never really feels, it never really feels like self-indulgent. It feels like this yeah. is what's required so that I can make sure that I can do this, this bigger work. I would imagine yeah. it would be something like, you know, am I the right person to bring this forward for the tribe? Is this what the tribe needs right now? Kind of stuff. Define G Center. I'm like, I'm the right person. I don't <laughs> yeah. ever ask that okay, question. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, that's a good me. point. It's, it's, who better than me? Of course, it's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah sometimes I'll say, is there someone I want to involve in this? Do I want contributors? Mm -hmm. Like with the magazine, I'm like, oh, who can I like? Two, four, where's my four here? You know, who else might want to contribute? Who else wants to write an article for this? Like who else might find this fun? So sometimes I'll do that, but I, I very rarely question it if I'm the person. <laughs> if you're the person. Um, to do something, yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense, yeah. I yeah. mean, but is why this would a manifestor question that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but is this the right time to, you know, is this gonna fit into what I'm already doing? Those questions definitely mm -hmm. I do ask for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay. Well, this has been so meaty and fast. I feel like there was one more thing I was going to say. Oh, I just want to make this note for anyone listening and picking up some of the things that Joy is saying about how she works. I just want to make note that her variables are all left. She is highly, highly structured. So and she has that defined root, which I find very useful in structure too. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, so part of my creative process has to be full on project management. Maybe not. <laughs> this is a part of her process. But if you have a lot of let leftness in your variable, it might, might be the thing for you too. Yes. Very good call out. And quad <laughs> left and living as a quad left is another thing that I started doing as a result of us working together. And I had copious amounts of resistance to that. I was like, I'm a Sagittarius, I'm creative. Like, I don't 
What do you mean eat at the same time every day? That's that seems like a lot. <laughs> and yeah, then I started planning my day by the hour and I was like, delicious. I feel so <laughs> served and so nourished and my brain has so much relief not having to think about what to do next. And this is so great. But yeah, for someone who has a lot of rightness, it probably sounds like a nightmare and that's totally correct for them. So great call yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So finally, I just want to hear from you, Miss Manifester, please inform us of anything you feel like informing, whether that's well, never mind. I don't want to put anything in your mouth. What do you, what would you like to inform us on? <laughs> yeah, I'll make this super easy. If you are listening to this, watching this, I'm going to assume that you enjoy audio, you enjoy deep conversations and deep dives. So I would love to extend an invitation for you to come over to my podcast. It's called Multi-Passionate Mastery, and it is a podcast specifically for multi-passionate creatives who want to embrace their talents as a gift, not a burden, not just conceptually, but with practical tools that you can apply to your everyday life. All of my strategic brain I have put into frameworks that work for creative people whether they are organized or not. And I share all of that on the podcast. So come over there and check it out. You can find everything else there. And if you're curious about the Thrive Guide, because we did spend some time talking about that, I'll make sure that Lexi has the link where you can subscribe to that free 10 part digital magazine series delivered monthly. Awesome. And then one more question. Do you have any advice for emotional manifestors. I'll circle back to how we began and say, I'm never gonna tell a manifestor what to do, but I will inform that what has been the most profound for me in terms of embracing my emotional authority as a part of my divine decision-making process is the mantra that taking my time saves me time. So if that feels good and if that resonates, then try it on. If not, leave it. I can't tell a manifester what to do. You probably already know what to do. So yeah, just, just go with that. And if you're in the space of anger around your emotional authority or confusion or frustration or sadness, I can tell you that it does get better. It does get better over time. And if you're tempted to experiment with other parts of your design before you really get into emotional authority, it's all correct. Like all the other experiments I've done have helped me with emotional authority. So whatever you're doing, you can't get it wrong. So you got this. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Listeners, please get on over to Joy's podcast. It is a gold mine. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to have this convo and I know that this is going to make a great impact on so many people. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to hang out with you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Your Golden. If you enjoyed what you heard, I invite you to submit a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you want to get in touch, you can either leave me a message on Anchor, shoot me a DM on Instagram, or send me an email. Just tap on the show notes for links to all three contact methods. And last but not least, please don't forget, you're golden. You're golden.